say hello i'm sakib um that's this is aditya hello uh, this is the second part of a talk that sorry give me one second. this is the second part of a talk that we gave uh last half uh, sorry last semester yeah october end of october yeah um so that talk was about this i mean the same topic but uh, we kind of broke up this question into four parts and we answered the first two parts last semester and we're going to answer the second part this semester <clears throat> uh, you want to hit present and then full screen but we have to hop around slides and stuff at the beginning uh, so just to quickly introduce ourselves uh, so i'm sakib i'm a production engineer at facebook uh, in menlo park I mainly work on traffic infrastructure stuff. So a lot of my daily work is networking and, and systems related. Hello, I'm Aditya. I work at Amazon Prime Video. Uh, I'm also a, I'm a software developer, uh, mainly work on uh, just delivering linear content at Prime Video, so like live TV stuff. A lot of my day-to-day -day is uh, just maintaining services that talk to other Prime Video services. So lots of inter-services inter uh, communication. Oh, I forgot to mention. Um, so my ro my role is production engineer. So that's a little different. Like um, when Facebook goes down, I'm like woken up in the middle of the night, and I have to go make it not go down again. Uh, but both me and Aditya are um, class of 2018 CS graduates. So if you have any questions about anything related to Rutgers CS, you can ask us as well. If you're graduating, you can ask us about industry, jobs, etc. Feel free. Cool. Uh, so last time we talked about, oh, let me hit present this time. Can you all see this? Yep. yep. All right. So last time we talked about um, the OS and browser side of things. And this time we're going to talk about the network and server side of things. Um, so the stuff we talked about last time was mostly, uh, you know, what actually happens when you type in the G key and hit enter, uh, what happens in the OS layer, the, the, what happens with the drivers, what happens with the schedulers, uh, how do interrupts work, how do context switches work, uh, how does the browser receive that action, that event, how does it parse the URL, how does it recommend uh, searches for you, that kind of stuff. And this time, this time we're going to talk about what well, we're going to spend probably the first half of this talk talking about the uh, the network side of things. So DNS, uh, IP, sockets, TCP, UDP, BGP, HTTP, uh, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time on server stuff. So load balancers, app servers, database servers, containers, caches, uh, which is per, like. That's what me and Aditya work with all day. Uh, so the rest of it is kind of like we assume it, we assume networking works uh, for the internet because it, you know, it's a good assumption to make. Let's do a quick uh, recap of what the first part of the talk was for, in case anyone here wasn't here for the first part. Oh, you mean go through the slides? Just yeah, just just quickly go through the first part, uh, high level concepts, so that anyone who wasn't here can get a good idea of where we are in the uh, flow. Uh, do you want to do this? Should I take over or? Uh, sure. I mean, like, I'll move through the slides, but. Yeah. Do you want to just going through the, the slides and like in order real quick? I'll talk about it. Yeah. Cool. So the high level overview of this talk is essentially, you know, what happens when you type google.com into the search bar? We started by first talking about what happens when you press the G key. Uh, what, what, what happens here is, you know, your keyboard sends a, uh, an interrupt to your CPU which gets looked up via something called an interrupt descriptor table, the IDT, uh, which the CPU is maintaining, which eventually you know, displays the G onto your uh, browser. We talked a little, a little bit about actually physically pressing the key, what happens with different keyboards, uh, and also how the keyboard communicates with the, the computer via something called drivers, uh, which are middlemen between uh, hardware devices and your computer. If you can go forward a little bit. 
And then we talked about, you know, this, we had this really amazing diagram that's keep created, uh, honestly. And we talked about a little bit about how different peripherals uh, talk to your uh, CPU via drivers. They each, each time, you know, uh, an event happens, it generates something called an interrupt, which gets scheduled by the CPU. And then that gets communicated to your software. Wait, I'm confused. What slide do you think I'm on right now? Uh, I mean, I can see the PowerPoint, so uh, Are you... it's kind of cheating. Okay. I, I'm, on, I'm on the diagram now. Do you see the diagram? I see hardware initialization. I think your computer's behind. I'm on the diagram. Uh, Max, what do you see? I see the diagram with okay. Naomi at the top. All right, so Aditya's stuff is behind. <laughs> uh, let me refresh. Cool. Um, Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see non ASCII characters. Yeah. So okay. there we go. This is something we that. forgot to mention last time. Uh, Aditya, you want to take over? Yeah. So a quick note about you know what happens when someone's trying to enter in non ASCII characters into the search bar. Uh, ASCII characters are essentially a standardized set of uh, characters that are uh, agreed upon in a format. Uh, but these include like 99% of use cases for most people, but they don't include things like foreign characters. So things like the umlaut, uh, the alpha, beta, gamma symbols, uh, the fancy like AE, Korean symbols, things like that uh, are not included in ASCII. They're part of Unicode. Uh, so what happens when someone tries to, you know, look, uh, go to like munich.com, munchen.com, and, uh, the, you know, the browser has to do this thing uh, called converting it to puny code, which is uh, an encoding which converts, you know, what you see there, munchen, into uh, this weird abomination, mnchen-3ya, or this Korean hangul into like what this random gibberish that you see here in the background, behind the user's uh, behind the user's view. Uh, this is done in order to like uh, just to uh, agree upon a standard uh, for characters, and in order to avoid like conflicting uh, like conflicting and mismatch between websites that are not supposed to point to uh, you know, their, their counterparts. So if you have two websites that are named the same thing, this is done to avoid, uh, avoid that confusion with foreign characters. Uh, and in the context of you know, this, uh, foreign characters, if there are foreign characters, they prepend like this XN dash dash in the encoding to let the browser know that this is a encoded string with foreign characters. Uh, so just a, little, uh, just a little thing that we found uh, about what happens when there's foreign non-ASCII characters in a URL. Cool. <clears throat> now onto the network stuff. <clears throat> so the first thing we'll talk about is DNS. Uh, did you want to start it? Sure. So, if, uh, so where we left off last time was, uh, you know, we've gotten to press the G key and we've seen, you know, google.com be autofilled into our search bar. So now we want to actually get from google.com into like contacting whatever entity google.com is. And this is where DNS or domain name system comes into play. Uh, I think I'm out of sync again, but I'll just keep going. So DNS or domain name system is there to bridge the gap between a human readable system like google.com to a machine readable system like IP addresses or MAC addresses. And DNS uh, deals, deals uh, access this go between and it runs as a background process on every internet connected device. Let's talk a little bit, a little bit about what IP and MAC addresses are, uh, so you understand like what they are in terms of networking. You may have heard the term like IP address, MAC address. Uh, so let's talk about the different kinds of IP addresses and what how they're different from MAC addresses. There's IPv4, which is the most common, commonly used type of IP address. Uh, you may see it as like four numbers separated by periods, uh, and they're in a pretty limited range of numbers. Uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, 5, 5, four times, specifically two to the 32 different possible addresses, um, which is why there's another kind of IP address uh, rolling out called IPv6, which will open up way more possible addresses, two to the 128. Uh, each machine on a network can be represented by one or many IP addresses. It'll advertise as being as ad it'll advertise those addresses uh, and be represented by those addresses. Uh, whereas a MAC address 
is a one-to-one -one hardware mapping for that device, and they are 100% unique. Uh, and they're, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're given at the time of manufacturing yep. uh, to be unique. Uh, whereas IP addresses can be recycled and reused by other devices. One day you might have 1.2.3.4, but tomorrow I'll have it. So you never know like when it's going to be the same. So DNS is there to kind of bridge this gap between letting users, uh, you know, letting humans uh, interact with something they're good at remembering, things like a brand name or like a company name, uh, to to bridge the gap between something that machines are better at remembering, like like numbers. Uh, so your router is much better at remembering 69, 193, 14, 30 than you are, um, which is why we have something called DNS. And the process, this DNS process that runs on every device um, will, will pull its information from many different sources. But essentially, it's represented by, uh, by a tree kind of structure. So if we can go over to the next slide. I'm on the next oh. slide. OK, also, sorry, one more thing that I forgot to mention. Um, because your IP addresses can change often, uh, it's important that you know you don't have to enter an IP address every time you want to go to a website um, because your router can hand out these IP addresses and take them back very quickly. Uh, and it assigns them via something called address resolution protocol or ARP, uh, which I think will we can mention at the very end of the talk. Uh, if people are interested, but is not a huge part of the big, bigger picture. So how does DNS actually, you know, get from Google.com to whatever IP address Google.com is, you know, hosted on? Uh, well, it has to kind of, you know, ask around. We're going to kind of make this analogy of how does it even begin to, um, how does it even begin to look for Google.com? Well, it asks. It asks the, the root, the highest level authority um, on, a, on a hypothetical tree about, do you know where Google.com is? And that, that hi, the highest level authority, you know, in this case, you know, President Obama, you're looking for someone in, in the army, Private Ted Cruz. Um, you ask Obama, you know, do you know where Private Ted Cruz is? And Obama is not going to know his Ted Cruz's home address, but he will tell you that General, uh, General Patton or, you know, some general in the army might know. Uh, so he routes you to General Patton. General Patton says, you know, I don't know where Private Ted Cruz lives, but Captain America here, uh, Captain America might know where, what company he's in. Uh, eventually, you know, you track down the company uh, and you so on and so forth, go to the lieutenants until you find out where Ted Cruz's home address is. And now you can actually start making that road trip down to Ted Cruz's house. And that's essentially what DNS does in a nutshell. Uh, it helps you route, um, from the from knowing no, absolutely nothing about where Google Google.com is, all the way down to knowing where its home address, or in this case, its IP address is. Uh, let's talk about actually. Let's talk about how this is implemented, kind of in real life. If we could go to the next slide. On the DNS hierarchy slide. Okay, it's super laggy for me. Uh, okay, so in in real life DNS applications, it's represented, represented in a tree very similar to what we saw before. It's a, it's a tree that starts at a root level. For those of you familiar with like data structures, think of this as a tree with like n number of children, right? The first level of this tree is the, is the domain names, the top level domains. So .com, .org, .edu, .net, .gov, uh, anything you can think of, all the domains are there. Um, when DNS reads a domain, it reads it right to left, like manga instead of us reading it left to right. So it reads google.com as .com google, or it reads drive.google.com as .com google drive. Uh, so similarly, if you can kind of imagine how this traversal would work, is it would first look for the .com leaf, or so the .com node, and then it would look for the Google node, and then the drive node at the bottom. Um, and even though this is kind of simple to uh, visualize, you want to think of each of these uh, each of these nodes in this tree as a as something called a name server. The name server uh, is responsible for actually uh, routing you to the next level of the the DNS tree. Um, so, for example, if you had something called something like cs.rutgers.edu, uh, and you want to get to that web page, or even like your iLab machines, if you guys use iLab machines, they'll have a name like 
python.cs.rutgers.edu. Uh, how do you route that? You start at the top, at the root level. If your computer has no idea where you know, python.cs.rutgers.edu is, you start at the root level. Uh, first, it asks for the .edu top level domain name server. Uh, the top level domain name server.edu will respond, okay, uh, I know where Rutgers is. It'll tell you where Rutgers.edu is. Then the Rutgers.edu name server will say, I know where CS is. Uh, C then it'll route you to the CS name server, which will then finally route you to your iLab machine, Python, uh, which you can see kind of displayed in this uh, graph here. Uh, okay. Data structures, people, yeah. Cool. Right. And, and at that point, you'll know what python.cs.records.edu's IP address is once you Correct. get down the, that far. Correct. At the, at the last host, it'll it'll be able to you know tell you what IP address it's advertising. Uh, and for anyone who's in data structures, just think of this as a distributed tree, uh, which where each node in this tree maintains like a hash table mapping uh, of where to go next. Uh, the key is uh, the the key is the host name, and the value is the IP address on this hash table. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Uh, slide. Um, is then IP address associated with each computer or each website? Uh, good question. So an IP address uh, is is dynamically assigned. So it's not necessarily assigned to a single website or a machine. Um, one machine can have an IP address or multiple IP addresses. So when you talk to an IP address, you're talking to like a machine more so than a website. Um, but you know, we'll get into this when we get to the end of the presentation where we talk about load balancers and how a website can be represented by a single IP address. Um, but just think of an IP address as a dynamic representation of a machine on a network, if that makes sense. Does that? Okay. Uh, does that? So, so, yeah, short yeah, short yeah. answer or host, I would probably say lean towards host. Lean towards machine, yep. Got you. Thank you. Uh, so now we have a little bit of a of a walkthrough of how this would work in practice. If you could go to the the next slide. Yep. Okay. We start at the the left end of the diagram where we have the uh, where we have your laptop to look in your browser cache to see if the browser already knows where Google.com is. And chances are it probably does because it's a very popular domain. In which case, you know, the, your browser will maintain a hash map in a, in form of a cache and say, here's the IP address for Google.com. Um, but let's assume that it doesn't know where google.com is. Uh, the first thing it does is it'll, you know, route to the, the ISP name server, which goes down this tree that we mentioned, uh, one by one, getting slowly getting pieces of each name server. Um, and eventually, you know, you'll, the final name server will return you the IP address for google.com, which is returned to your browser. Uh, your browser caches this uh, for next time use, and now you have the IP address for google.com. Uh, thanks to all the different name servers who played their part in this. Cool. Yeah, so that's that's DNS. Um, something I forgot to mention earlier. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this talk is to give you a cursory understanding of all the different technologies that were that are involved, uh, or the major technologies that are involved with like getting you the response from Google.com. Uh, we're not trying to go into details about ex like everything about how BGP works step by step. Um, if you're curious about it, we can do that in the Q and A part of this. Uh, but that stuff is usually better left for classes like 352 or Internet of Technology stuff like that. Or you Absolutely. can or you can Google it. Yep. Cool. So uh, you know this is a remote talk, and it's a lot harder to convey visual. Uh, analogies to you guys. So I'm going to, um, because I don't have a whiteboard, but I'm going to try to put a picture in your mind and stay consistent with that. Okay. So think for a second, you're in New York City and you want to ship some control substances to your buddy in Baltimore. Okay. So, you, um, you know, what does that involve? Uh, New York City has a dock, Baltimore has a dock. Uh, there are peers on those docks and, you know, you have to put stuff on a ship and then ship the ship to from one pier to the next. Your buddy has to be on the other pier and know which pier it's arriving at. Uh, similarly, when you're sending packets from one computer to another, um, <clears throat> there's this concept called ports. So ports are kind of like peers on the dock uh, of this 
city that is your computer. So there are approximately two to two to the 16 possible ports on your machine, uh, zero to 65,535. There are common ports used for common things. So HTTP traffic goes over port 80. Uh, HTTPS, a secure HTTP traffic goes over 443. Whenever you SSH into a machine, the SSH packets go to port 22. The DNS stuff we all talked about all communicates over port 53. These are just common numbers, pretty much like peer 53 on a dock, like that's dedicated for DNS ships, if that makes sense. Uh, 3724 is for World of Warcraft. Uh, <laughs> different applications kind of just like reserve their own ports. Um, and then there's the other concept of sockets. So uh, you're not, you know, you're not going to want to stand at the port for 24 hours and wait for your shipment to send and, and arrive and stuff. So you might hire like a, like a, a foreman to watch over your shipment for you. Um, this foreman represents your connection between your, your, you and your friend. Um, so, and similarly, sockets are kind of like the endpoints for an active connection. They're defined by an IP and port combination. So your source IP address is where, and, and your ports and your source ports is where it defines your local socket. And then the remote, remote IP and remote port define the remote socket. The type of a socket is either TCP or UDP. Uh, these are different protocols that kind of characterize what kind of human is overseeing the shipment or what kind of socket this is. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about those two protocols. <clears throat> Again, there's two types of humans that oversee a shipment. Uh, there's UDP. So this is kind of like, Imagine the foreman kind of just like um, does the bare minimum, sits back on a hammock all day, sends the ship into the ocean and says, good luck, uh, does not, is not very accountable. You know, it's kind of like us on a bad day. Uh, but, you know, they, they do, they don't get, they don't like have much overhead. So that, that's kind of what UDP is like. And then TCP is more like, this is a person who's trying really, really hard to make sure nothing goes wrong with your shipment. Everything is delivered uh, in order, in time, that kind of stuff. Um, some of the stuff that TCP does is uh, number the ships that you're sending over. So it'll, it'll send ship one, two, three, four in order uh, and make sure those arrive in order. Uh, how it does that is it makes sure that the ships that go to deliver the shipment also come back so that it can say, okay, one came back, two came back, three didn't come back. Okay, I have to resend the shipment that three was missing. Um, and, if and if it doesn't come back, then it's like, oh, maybe I was sending ships too quickly. So it starts sending ships at a slower rate, if that makes sense. That's called congestion control. So the TCP foreman is a lot smarter um, but sometimes their meticulousness can cause slowness uh, and can congest the, the network. So certain types of content, like video content, you prefer to use protocols like UDP. Uh, often you'll actually see when you're like, you know, pirating videos on the internet, you'll see uh, your video, like the, some of the frames of the video will buffer and like get corrupted, but then the next few frames will be fine. Right. Um, that's fine to happen for video because people don't really care about a couple of frames here and there being corrupted. Uh, for more important things like bank transactions, you never want that kind of stuff to have any corruption in that. Right. So you, most applications on the internet use TCP to propagate packets or in the ship analogy, send shipments from one peer to another. Also, I want to mention, like, we're in the part of the process where we're sending a request out to the IP address that we've um, found. So we're in this, we're in that phase of the process. Right. So this is kind of like the part where you were establishing a foreman for to send an overseer shipment. And so tech-wise, a TCP connection between two uh, computers is set up via like, something called a TCP handshake. Uh, and this is something you'll have to know if you're ever asked what happens when you type in google.com on an in, in an interview they're specifically looking for you to mention the tcp handshake among other things like dns and bgp so
So um, it's pretty simple. There's only three parts to a TCP handshake. Uh, actually, I mean, there's like 10 parts in, in actuality, but there are three um, primary parts, let's say. Uh, so the first part is the SYN part, S-Y-N. It's short for synchronization. Second part is ACK, or short for acknowledgement. And then the last part is uh, SYN, sorry, the second part is SYN ACK. Then the third part is ACK. So um, on the left here, you see your computer. And on the right here, you see your server. Your computer sends out a synchronized request to your server. It's kind of like, hey, I want to set up a TCP connection. The server gets this request and the server is like, okay, I'm going to acknowledge that you want to set up a synchronization request and I'm going to try to synchronize with you as well. Like I'm going to say that I'm ready for synchronization. Then your computer has to receive that and say, okay, I acknowledge that you acknowledged my synchronization request. And that's a TCP handshake. Make sense? So fairly straightforward. That's how to set up a connection. And then there's another type of packet called a, a fin packet, which is kind of like, hey, it's sent from your computer and your computer is like, hey, I want to close the connection. And then the server will be like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll close my socket. I'll like, you know, fire or kill my foreman. <clears throat> um, just so like, you know, there's not more sockets left over on the server. It's kind of like a, like a nice thing to do. Cool. Uh, and if you've heard of things like SSL or TLS before, um, this is, or if you've heard of, you've obviously heard of uh, HTTPS before, um, because, you know, all these websites that you go to these days have HTTPS before the, as the protocol before the website name. Um, that's basically HTTP that is happening over a secure connection using SSL at TLS. So we're not going to go in depth on how this actually works. Uh, th this could be a whole separate hacker hour on its own. But think of it as a way to make your connection secure. So in the ship analogy, this is a way to make sure that your shipments are actually going to the intended recipient and not like the cops or some pirates somewhere. Uh, and it also ensures that you, if your shipments are hijacked on the ocean by seafaring brigands or the CIA, uh, they won't be able to unlock your boxes of substances or even see that what you're shipping. Um, if, you're, if your connection is not secure, then your packets are susceptible to all kinds of piracy and spying, uh, and they could be going to suspicious characters rather than, you know, your buddy in Baltimore. Which is why all these websites these days are like, we don't even serve Google.com on HTTP anymore. Please, you know, upgrade your browser or stuff like that. Any questions on that? Um, are those encryptions um, using um, prime factorization? Sorry, what'd you say? Um, so how those encryption, um, I guess, what algorithm does those encryption use? Yeah, I think so. The so the most popular uh, system that we use these days is RSA public key encryption. Uh, if you've heard of RSA before, uh, like I've I've taken many many lectures at Rutgers about RSA, and it's still kind of hazy. Uh, but it, it it's like a very cool mathy way to uh, make sure that there's no one who can possibly uh, snoop on your message except for the intended recipient. Uh, if you Google RSA or publicly crypto system, then, uh, you know, you can learn about all about that. Yeah, I, I, we can, we can definitely go over like the actual details at, at the end. Feel free to, you know, stick around. I'd be happy to go over it. Cool. 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 Do you think, um, a quantum computer can break it through Shor's algorithm? I mean, uh, RS, if, if RSA I, 2048 is the, is the latest one, right? I believe, uh, I don't think it's been cracked. Oh, it's, it's it's resilient to shores. Twenty forty eight, I believe so. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of uh, algorithms that are not uh, that are su not susceptible to, uh, you know, quantum computing attacks. So, RSA is yeah. just popular because it's you know simple enough, and you know it just hap It's it's like legacy. <laughs> Cool. 
Uh, so if there's no questions on TCP UDP sockets ports, we'll move on. So BGP, this is kind of like the actually important stuff. Uh, so this is kind of like how the internet works. So um, you've gone through the whole process of DNS and you've turned google.com, a human readable brand name into an IP address. How do we get to that IP address? How do we actually send your packets to whatever machine is represented by that IP address? So the basis of this travel is router to router. So you have a router at your house. It's the reason that you're able to even get on this Zoom call. Um, routers are you know, basically computers that are specialized for networking. Uh, they maintain these things called routing tables, which is a data structure okay, that maps a, the nearby network topology in a table. Um, basically, the whole job of the router is to figure out the optimal next hop for a packet with a given destination IP address. So if you're trying to, if you have a friend in Belgium and you want to set up a Skype call with them, the start of the journey is that your packets go from your machine through your local area network, your LAN, uh, to your router. Uh, and then it goes into the internet, which we'll explain in like five seconds. Uh, packets on the internet have TTLs. So TTL is short for time to live. Uh, by default, this is 60. So if the packet hops around different routers more than 60 times, uh, the next router will see that the TTL has been decremented down to zero and it'll drop the packet. They won't, it won't forward it anymore. Does that make sense? So uh, that's why, you know, the internet isn't congested with, uh, de like packets that have no legitimate destinations. Yep. Uh, there's many, many reasons for time to live. Uh, one of them is like retry storms. So you don't just get the same packet, like over and over. Um, just making sure that a packet doesn't just continue. Like, you, you know, the, the, the end state of the packet at some point, uh, what happened to the packet? There's many, many reasons for why that, if you're wondering why we have a time to live, why not, why don't we just don't let them stay infinitely? Cool. Uh, and again, routers are really, really good at, at, you know, and their hardware and software optimized to send packets and forward packets as, as fast as humanly possible. Uh, but, you know, they still can't handle infin infinite uh, amounts of packets. Um, so now that we understand that routing tables are the basis uh, and of router to router travel, and that's the basis of travel of packets in the internet, Think of the internet as a collection of connected uh, keyword autonomous systems. Okay, I'm going to shorthand that to AS, autonomous system. Uh, think of an AS as a cloud of routers, okay, that all belong to one business entity. So a Comcast or an Optimum or a SKT Telecom will uh, have a cloud of routers that belong to them. Your home network is a local area network, a LAN. Uh, that is represented by one router. So you have one or more computers at your house uh, and they are connected over whatever, probably Wi-Fi to your uh, home router. This, your home router is connected by wire up to your ISP's autonomous system. So your ISP, I don't know what ISPs you guys have, but they have an autonomous system somewhere in like a, a, some warehouse or facility somewhere. Um, and that is how you're provided internet via their autonomous system. Each autonomous system in the world is connected to one or more other autonomous systems, and they forward each other internet traffic uh, based on different types of relationships that they have between ISPs. So <clears throat> uh, ASs have two main types of relationships. There's called peer there's peering and there's transit. So I'll, I'll go over that in the next slide. Uh, and then two more things to know. One is that every single autonomous system has the globally unique autonomous system number, so an ASN. Uh, and then autonomous system routers use BGP, which is a protocol called Border Gateway Protocol, to learn uh, which autonomous systems they should forward traffic to. And we'll see an example of that in the next slide. Um, all of this travel between autonomous systems happens over physical wiring. So optical cables or copper wire uh, is essentially how your packets are traveling, except for within in like intra-land travel. So TLDR, uh, if you're talking to your friend in Belgium over Skype, uh, your packets go from your machine through your LAN to your ISP's autonomous system, somehow travels through a whole, like, Un undetermined amount of autonomous systems somehow ends up in your friend's ISP's AS 
forwards to your friend's LAN router and eventually ends up on their machine. Uh, next slide is to try to illustrate this with an example. So think of, uh, if you've taken data structures, uh, think of each autonomous system as a macro node on a graph, okay? So it's a node that actually has many other micro nodes inside of it, but you can all kind of treat it as a big node in a bigger graph. Um, so I said that there were two types of AS relationships. One is called peering and one is called transit. So a peering relationship is kind of like two ISPs of similar size agree to forward traffic between each other's ASs for free. Um, so like a Comcast and a, and a does Verizon has serve I, 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 is an ISP? Is that, is that true? Yeah, Verizon Files. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Comcast and Verizon might have like an agreement that, you know, old people sat in a room and said, okay, let's have a peering a relationship. Uh, and that's just kind of like, we'll, we'll scratch your back if you scratch ours. Transit is different. Transit is a customer to uh, provide a relationship. So transit is like a small local ISP will pay for access to a larger provider ISP's network. So this is kind of like uh, if you're in a, like a village in uh, you know, Bangladesh and you, ha you have a local ISP, that local ISP will like forward, connect you to the rest of the internet, but it'll do that by paying, you know, Comcast or something like whatever large ISPs in that is in South Asia. <clears throat> so given that, uh, let's look at this example. Let's say your home's ISP is the autonomous system uh, in the top left. So AS65101. Uh, you want to Skype, <coughs> Skype call your friend whose home is connected to the bottom right ISP, uh, 404. Uh, your small local ISP in the top left uh, has a transit relationship with the middle ISP, okay? So, like, the, your packets, your Skype video packets go from your home network to your, uh, to the top left ISP's autonomous system and, can, and then gets forwarded to the middle ISP's uh, autonomous system. Uh, once the packets get there, the routers have to make a decision. Should they get to the bottom right ISP via the direct link or through the bottom left? and then going right to the bottom right. Uh, you might think, oh, obviously, duh, like less hops is better. You might just be like, okay, so it's gonna go from R2 to R3 to R9. Uh, but this is often not the case. Uh, it really depends on what relationships there exist. So for example, if there's a transit relationship between R3 and R9, uh, then you know AS202 might not want to pay for that travel so they might and they, they might have a peering relationship with 303 so if they go about uh sending your packets to 303 and then 303 has the job of forwarding the traffic to 404 then you know the middle isp will forward traffic via the two other hops instead the other uh, other factor in this is distance this does not portray distance so distance also plays a factor in which decision they make yeah, so distance uh, plays a factor. Also, the health of the routers in an autonomous system play a factor in BGP decisions. Uh, you can read all about BGP if you Google it, but it, it's a pretty cool protocol. It's basically, again, how the internet works. Isn't uh, a longer route take more um, carbon footprint? Uh, pushing bits across copper wire is, a, you know, I would say not a massive carbon footprint compared to the rest of the issues in the world. Um, what if you have a lot of, um, I guess, economy of scale? Uh, I mean, so if, you're, if your point is that it's inefficient, it could be, it could be the case that arbitrary ISP relationships uh, end up making some of this travel inefficient. Uh, the extent to which these inefficiencies, uh, you know, have a carbon footprint, I mean, that's probably like a research paper waiting to be made. Cool. Thank you. Uh, regardless of all this VGP stuff, your, your packets will eventually get to the destination, as long as your ISP is connected to like a decent ISP, uh, AS autonomous system network. Cool. And that's where we take over with uh, HTTP or hypertext transfer protocol, which is the system we're using to communicate between two, two machines. Uh, 
if you can go over to the next slide. Yep. Okay. So we've gotten, we've used BGP to kind of go to the destination that we want to arrive at. We're there. Uh, we're at the doorstep uh, and we have our package in hand of, of whatever we want to trade, right? Um, the, we're going to knock on the door and the, the person at the door is going to, you know, ask us a few questions based on how HTTP works. We're going to, uh, we're going to explain these. So the person at the door is going to ask us, is this addressed to me? Uh, is this person who's, you know, delivering this package, are they allowed to deliver this package? Um, is this package something that I asked for? Is this something I used or something I can use? Uh, things like that. And they're going to make sure that the package is, you know, something they requested. Uh, similarly, HTTP does the same thing when the, a, a request comes into that machine. Uh, it's going to look at the request and it's going to say, what is it asking for? Uh, similar, namely, it can be one of uh, these things. It can be a get request, a post, put, head, delete. Um, it's going to ask, does the domain that it's uh, support what it's asking for, meaning if it's google.com, uh, does it actually support, you know, whatever, uh, whatever the request is asking for? Uh, is the site, is the path valid? So like google.com slash ABCDE, not a valid path. Uh, and are you allowed to do this method? Are you, are you, are you who you say you are? Uh, did you authenticate via the proper mechanisms we talked about earlier, SSL, IP? Uh, and once, you know, HTTP has all the agreements, uh, that person at the doorstop is going to accept that package. He's going to accept that HTTP package. Um, and he's going to, you know, give you back another packet a package of substances uh, that you requested. Uh, and this is going to be in the form of, uh, in our case, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images. Uh, and they're going to be wrapped up in a nice little bundle. And they're going to have a label on, on it with the same things that you put on yours. It's going to be like who sent it, where it's going, uh, what it's asking for, um, and what, and most importantly, uh, a code uh, such as like 200, 300 something, 400 something, 500 something. Uh, which determines the status of that request. You may have seen codes like this. So in our example, a 200 is like, okay, your shipment's good to go. Here you go. A 300 is like, wrong house, dude. Uh, try the next one. Um, 400 something is like, you're trespassing. Get out of here. Or this doesn't exist. Or, this house doesn't exist. Um, or a server error is like, oh, this shipment we were supposed to give you uh, got, you know, a trapped, got trapped somewhere. You don't have it. Uh, so that, that's kind of an example of wh what happens when you see these server errors or what happens when you see these errors in your HTTP response, which is the packet they're returning to you. Uh, and your, um, your delivery uh, entity is going to take this packet and do the same router to router journey we just talked about and bring it all the way back to your machine. So it's going to do all the same hops that we talked about in BGP uh, and it's going to try to find its way back to your ISP's AS and then back to your router. And, and now we're going to get to how does it actually show up on your browser. Uh, so we have this neat little package of stuff, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, images. Uh, if you can go over to the next slide. Yep. Uh, we have this neat, neat little package and we want to, you know, display it. We want to organize it and figure out how to, you know, show our hoard, uh, what we got in this package to everyone, make it pretty. Uh, how do we do this? How does our browser, you know, render this? package of data. Uh, the first thing it does is it parses the, the HTML. So for those of you who are familiar with HTML, you'll know that it's represented by like different tags, uh, namely things like HTML, head, body, title, P, H1, H2. Uh, what the browser is going to do is it's going to read through that HTML, organize it in a, tr in a tree structure. Uh, again, the same thing as DNS, it's going to be an N, N tree, meaning it can, uh, one node can have N children. And each of those children are going to be um, organized in like a top-down level. Uh, this allows the browser to kind of read it in a logical organization uh, because of how the language is. Uh, once it has converted into this tree structure called a document object model keyword, a DOM, uh, some of you may have done the assignment DOM tree in data structures. Uh, if you have, amazing. Uh, if you have not, just know that it's a, 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 a N, N children tree. Um, once you have this DOM tree, uh, your browser is then going to go through the CSS files that you have, and it's going to look through the CSS files and it's going to inject all the all the style uh, tags into your uh, DOM. So it's going to traverse the DOM and it's going to be injecting style elements into 
each of the different nodes on the DOM tree. Uh, once it has like this, once it has what style is associated with which element, it's going to go ahead with the rendering part. What happens here is it's going to traverse the DOM again from top to bottom. It's going to calculate the style values. It's going to do the arithmetic, uh, arithmetic to figure out the width, height, position, coordinates, shape of all the different uh, elements that are in the DOM, uh, all the different resources that it has. And it's going to send it all to a compositing process, something like Direct3D, OpenGL, if you've heard of these technologies. Uh, they're responsible for uh, taking uh, taking uh, like taking uh, rent like things to render and displaying them, rendering them uh, essentially rendering uh, the rendering software and this is where your GPU comes into play where it'll take what it's asked to render and actually go ahead and do the rendering based on the resources that have been presented uh, to your browser this is how we get from kind of just a package of random assortments uh, to actually parsing it out uh, adding in the flavor the CSS and then rendering it out and putting it into a nice little smorgasbord, if you will, of, of different um, elements. And to finally, you'll see that google.com logo. You'll see the search bar. You'll see the search and the I'm feeling lucky. I don't know if they got rid of that. Um, you'll see the little links on top, the menu. Uh, and this is how you, how you see that finally get to that google.com web page. Um, so a lot, most of the stuff that we talked about is can kind of be encapsulated by this model that we have right here. Um, we could literally spend uh, two hours or three hours on just this slide. Uh, this is called the Open System Interconnect Model, OSI, uh, and it was developed by the ISO, the International Standards Organization. Uh, and the modern internet is kind of like a found, founded upon this abstract communication model. <clears throat> So at the bottom here, we have physical. So this is kind of like traveling over copper wire, uh, bits traveling over copper wire. Above that, we have data link. So this is where uh, you have ethernet connections, um, sending or organizing packets into frames of like a thousand packets each, uh, or a thousand bit byte bits each, and uh, sending it over, assuming that the physical layer works. Then, you have with the, then we have the network layer that assumes that the data link layer works. Uh, and this is where you have protocols like IP, like uh, all the stuff we talk about with IP addresses and PGP stuff happens at this layer of the internet. Um, this is the layer at which routers work. Then we have above that the transport layer. So this is the stuff at which um, we take, we assume that the IP stuff underneath works and we build abstractions like TCP or UDP or connections or sockets. Um, Above the transport layer, we build even more abstractions, assuming that the transport layer works. Uh, we build things like, um, oh, I guess sockets are at the session layer. I always thought they were at the transport layer. Anyway, above that, you have this presentation layer, so all the different uh, like file types. So you have JPG, you have you know uh, MPEG, all the you know all these different file types or different types of protocols within the presentation layer. And then, and then above that, you have the application layer. So this is like where most of the stuff that you're familiar with are. So DNS, SSH, HTTP, ARP, uh, these all are at this layer. When I say they're at this layer, I mean that they assume that all the previous layers underneath work. So essentially when we're sending packets, uh, we're going, this entire talk is kind of just going down this OSI stack and then all the way back up in rendering google.com, if you can think of it that way. Right. So when you have your computer and you're trying to build a packet to send to somewhere else, right, uh, you're at the application layer. So imagine you have a packet, right? You have a box, okay? And you put like whatever Adderall inside it. Uh, you wrap it inside this other box called HTTP and you put some more data, more content inside there that says stuff like, you know, this is a get request. Uh, I'm trying to get google.com slash search, uh, stuff like that. Underneath that, you have the presentation layer. Uh, ignore some of these layers, and then you get to the transport layer, and eventually you wrap it in another box that says, uh, "Put, give me a TCP socket. Uh, I'm going to this port on this IP address. Uh, then you get to the networks layer. So this kind of wraps it in another box uh, and says, you know, more stuff, I don't know. Eventually you wrap it in enough boxes until it can get down to the physical layer. And then it's just a whole bunch of, it's, treat, it's treated as a whole bunch of bits that are sent over copper wire. 
And then on the receiving end, it unpacks all these boxes one by one um, until it has the, you know, the stuff that it wants. Yeah, each layer like strips away a layer like an onion and then takes it the part that it's looking at, treats it and then routes it accordingly. And then the next layer opens it up again, takes out its part, sends it back up, so on. Uh, and uh, when we're kind of building these, uh, this Russian doll structure, uh, each, uh, like the metadata inside those uh, outer, like those auxiliary Russian dolls uh, is kind of organized into a header. A header is just a bunch of metadata. Uh, so for example, the IP header will have things like um, source address and destination address. The TCP header will have things like sequence number, uh, source port, destination port. And then you can imagine what the other headers have. Cool. Um, so a couple of minutes left, but we'll talk about we'll take the rest of the time to talk about our jobs, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so we just kind of assume that everything else works, and so in our jobs, we on a day-to-day -day basis work with the technologies that we're about to mention. So. When your when your packets like requesting Google.com get to finally get to a Google server, uh, this is kind of the way that they are processed, or this is kind of like this is the pathway they take uh, within Google's fleet. Uh, so initially, there's a load balancer tier. So this is a tier of servers, many servers that receive incoming HTTP requests and distribute them evenly, uh, like route them correctly to the other servers. There's tons of different types of uh, load balancer algorithms, and we'll talk about a couple in the next slide. Um, but think of this as kind of like, you know, the concierge at a, you know, at a, a place that you're visiting. They'll like direct you to the right place. Uh, usually, if you're asking for static content, uh, it's it's co-located with the load balancers uh, and with a Oh, sorry. If you're asking for static content, it's usually on cache servers that are co-located with load balancers. So if you're asking for cat videos, uh, it's probable that other people have in the area have also asked for the same cat video. And so that'll probably be cached locally with a load balancer uh, using a cache technology like memcached. If it's not, uh, if you're asking for a dynamic request, like if you're, say, you're sending a post request to Google, um, then your request will be, will be forwarded to an application server. So this is a tier that runs an application like google.com and serves HTTP responses on port 80 or 443. Uh, they communicate via uh, REST. If you've heard of that REST before, it's a standard that was built upon HTTP uh, to normalize requests and responses structures. Uh, and app server's whole job is to expose services on web endpoints. So if you've gone to YouTube and typed in, you know, some, the name of some video, you'll see that the URL then says youtube.com slash search. That's the service that Google YouTube servers um, provide. Uh, if you're asking for data that is not in a cache, but should be in a database, then your app servers will send outgoing requests to database servers uh, on dynamic requests for non-static content. This tier is optimized for storage. So you'll usually see databases, database servers have like much higher amounts of storage than application servers or load balancers. By storage, I mean disk uh, or SSD, not, uh, not stuff like RAM. RAM, like, anyway, but we'll talk about resources if you are, guys are curious. Um, and then there's an aside that I had on containers and virtualization, but uh, it's not really relevant to fleet architecture, I would say. Uh, do things like Docker, VMware, and Kubernetes are just a good way to make sure that your applications can run on any server uh, on a fixed set of resources. Um, here's an illustration of what I meant. So you're an end user, you're going through the internet, and by the going through the internet, you know, I was talking about this whole ASN mess. Uh, Eventually you get to a load balancer and load balancers can be software based or hardware based. Uh, and then they're distributed to application servers. Um, 
some examples of load balancing algorithms. So what's kind of surprising is that, you know, you would imagine that there are uh, complicated load balancer algorithms. The simpler ones are often better. So randomly choosing two of your application servers and then picking whichever server of those is, is uh, less loaded is usually just fine. That's usually a super effective way to do load balancing. Um, and it's like, there's a research paper that proves it. Uh, and then different services have totally different needs and architectures. What we just told, talked to you about uh, is common for application, uh, common web applications, but like 